newborn babies, the most precious, the most innocent thing on the planet. The very thought of anyone even wishing something ill upon something so beautiful is so abhorrent and so inhuman that it's almost unfathomable. But sadly, some dark souls out there won't just have these thoughts. They will bring them into reality. They will take action and do the unthinkable. This is the full and detailed case of Lucy Letby. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, if your name is on screen right now then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those affected by this dark case. Our story begins in the heart of Cheshire, England. There, the Countess of Chester Hospital has stood for centuries. From humble beginnings as a dispensary for the needy in the 1800s, it has grown into a vital institution offering a wide range of medical services. At the core of the hospital's mission is a commitment to serving the community. From maternity care to specialised units in cardiology, oncology and more. The hospital also stands as a hub for medical research and education, fostering collaboration with universities as well as medical schools. More specifically to this story, the neonatal unit is a sanctuary for the tiniest of patients where the delicate cries of newborns can be heard throughout each day. It is a place of both vulnerability and resilience. A place where the dedication of healthcare professionals provide the best care possible. Chester in Cheshire, England is a city that is infested with history and charm. It can be dated back to the Roman times. It is the city where many excited families give birth to beautiful newborn children. But the pictures painted here aren't always beautiful. In Nursery 1, often referred to as the Hot Room, the Countess of Chester Hospital's dedicated staff faced many challenging circumstances. In November of 2013, Victoria and Michael Whitfield welcomed their precious daughter Felicity into the world at just 34 weeks. In those early days, the Whitfields placed their trust in the caring hands of Lucy Letby a nurse that had recently begun working on the unit. Lucy was described as a sweet, innocent nurse, one that the Whitfields were happy to have taken care of their newborn bundle of joy. On November 20th, Lucy sat beside baby Felicity, and then the peaceful atmosphere was shattered. The sound of alarms pierced the air, and Lucy sprang into action. She pressed the emergency button to call for reinforcements, doing what she could to restore the baby's health. As the medical team rushed into the room, they worked tirelessly to save Felicity's life with intense focus, a life which had suddenly taken a dark turn. Felicity's lungs had collapsed. She was holding on to life by a single thread. The medical team was able to fully intubate and stabilise the new baby, but questions still remained about what exactly had caused such a drastic change. This would be the first of many suspicious occurrences at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The next two years would remain relatively quiet in a neonatal unit, at least as far as unexplained complications were concerned. However, on June 8, 2015, that all would change. Baby A, one of a pair of twins, began displaying signs of distress, an all too common occurrence in a place where newborn babies are closely monitored. While baby A's mother was concerned about the distress, the nurse in charge 
Kutcher told her not to worry as she monitored his progress. But within 26 minutes, that same nurse recognised the gravity of the situation. They urgently called for a doctor to intervene. The baby's stats were tanking and it wasn't looking good. Among the chaos, the baby's mother anxiously awaited for news on her child's fate, watching as doctors crowded around her baby. The nurse tried to reassure the mother in a calming manner, offering words of comfort in the most difficult of moments. However, the situation took a sombre turn as the urgency escalated. Before the clock struck nine on that night, baby A's struggle came to a heartbreaking end leaving medical professionals to grapple with an unexplained loss. In the aftermath, the nurse extended a gentle gesture to the grieving parents, offering to bathe and dress the baby, giving them intimate time with him before he was taken to the mortuary. In the wake of baby A's tragic loss, the entire neonatal unit endured intense emotional strain, and just 28 hours later, the unthinkable happened. Baby B, baby A's twin sister, suddenly collapsed. A sense of urgency filled the air once more as another emergency situation unfolded. In those tense moments, baby B was successfully resuscitated saved from the same fate as her twin brother. While relief washed over the team and the parents, questions still swelled as to what exactly had gone wrong. They performed testing to try and discern exactly what had happened, finding that baby B had loops of gas-filled bowels, indicating that a bowel obstruction had caused the collapse. This was not a cause for immediate concern. Baby B was monitored closely as she eventually gained health, and she was eventually discharged with her still grieving parents. On June the 14th, 2015, Baby C made its entrance into the world. He was born 10 weeks before his due date. His arrival was met with cautious optimism, requiring no immediate medical attention and seemingly in good health. Despite this good news, the fact that he was premature landed him in the neonatal unit. The staff in this unit closely monitored Baby C's progress, and all seemed well until another grim turn took place. In the midst of the challenge to save his life, a nurse's hushed words to Baby C's mother carried the weight of the world. She said, He's going. Despite everyone's efforts, Baby C's condition just couldn't be repaired. He passed away within a day of his birth, leaving another unexplained crisis on the books. Baby D was brought into the world six days later as a full-term infant. However, she found herself in a neonatal unit since the mother's water had broken early. Medical professionals had given her a clean bill of health but kept her in for observation. However, as the early hours of her life unfolded, Baby D endured a series of unexplained crises. Throughout the course of two horrifying hours, Baby D coded time and time again. Nurses noted that she had skin discoloration each time they had to rush to her aid. Baby D would suffer yet another collapse just 34 minutes later. This sadly ended her life before it could even truly begin. Now, after four unexplained emergency situations in just one month, the head of the neonatal department, Dr. Breary, took notice of the strange occurrences. He conducted a meticulous review of Baby D's case, as well as the three previous unexplained incidents. However, no definitive conclusions arose from the investigation, leaving only further questions about what was happening at the hospital. Babies E and F were born 10 weeks premature. They resided in a neonatal unit under the care of a medical team. On August the 3rd, 2015, their mother visited the unit, milk bottles in hand, but her discovery left her concerned. She noticed that baby E had a red liquid around his mouth. She called out to the nurse nearby to check on him. The nurse quickly calmed her nerves, 
saying it was simply a result of tube irritation in baby E's stomach. The twins' mother was calmed, but tensions only grew as a doctor visited on his rounds the next morning. Upon inspection of baby E, the doctor had noticed the same thing. They found fresh red fluid coming up baby E's tube. From outside the unit, baby E's mother heard the familiar sound of her own child's horrendous crying. She rushed to find her baby in distress as resuscitation attempts were being made. But despite their best efforts, baby E was the fourth baby that had lost his life suddenly and without reason. Less than 24 hours later, baby F crashed as well, leaving the hopeless mother in a state of utter despair. Luckily though, baby F was able to be restored to full health, but this left behind another suspicion that could no longer be ignored. It was at this point that nurses became suspicious of these occurrences. Further testing showed abnormal levels of insulin in baby F's system. This could not be explained away easily. The nurses began to suspect that someone had overdosed the infant with insulin. This must have caused a myriad of complications from the extreme levels. By October, three more infants had passed away unexpectedly. Something had to be done. Nurses, doctors and even Dr. Berry went to their supervisors and consultants to beg for some kind of investigation from upper management, but their cries were muffled by words that claimed they were making a fuss. Even though some kind of investigation was promised, it wouldn't take place until February of 2016. Dr. Berry had waited too long, he knew he had to take action. After ordering a thematic review to the now extremely high toll of lost lives, he found one common factor that existed among every single unexplained occurrence. One nurse that had been on staff during every single collapse. This nurse's connection to mortalities and scares were met with confirmation from doctors and nurses that were uncomfortable with working with her. Suspicion within the unit had already been growing about her behaviour. Dr. Berry called a meeting to discuss his findings. The findings were sent to the medical director of the hospital, Ian Harvey. Dr. Berry begged for an emergency meeting to take action, but no such meeting would occur for three more months. During this three-month period, two more babies experienced life-threatening circumstances that could not otherwise be explained. They were found with either air or extreme amounts of insulin within their system. This couldn't be an accident. These actions were clearly intentional. Other nurses and doctors were refusing to work with this one nurse, the nurse that was becoming increasingly more suspicious. Taking action to the best of their ability, the nurse of interest was no longer allowed to work on night shifts. She was banned until the confusion was settled. On May the 11th, Dr. Berry would finally get his urgent meeting with Harvey and Alison Kelly, Kelly being the director of nursing. It was during this meeting that Berry would spout his complaints, his concerns and alarms about the nurse who everyone was now afraid of. With seemingly nothing being done to stop the huge spike in child mortality rates. However, the only response that was received was an assurance letter from the NHS Trust. This is the organisational unit in charge of that hospital. According to this letter, there was no evidence whatsoever to suggest that a nurse was causing this huge mortality rate. They put it down to purely coincidence. With nowhere to turn, doctors and nurses in the neonatal units were forced to return to work, knowing that every day would be riddled with anxiety over the next child's collapse. By June of 2016, directly after another strange crisis, the nurse in question had taken a vacation to Ibiza. Everyone was now able to settle and breathe, at least for a little while. During this two-week vacation, no emergent situations occurred within the neonatal unit, but on June the 23rd, the nurse had returned. This was just in time for another life on the neonatal unit to end. 
child O was a perfectly healthy baby. He was due to be discharged to his parents. As had always occurred, he collapsed unexpectedly, leaving shocked and distraught parents behind. 13 minutes later, Baby O's triplet brother met the exact same fate. This was the final straw. It had to end here. Too many lives had been lost. Doctors and nurses were tired of standing by and doing nothing, of receiving no help from above. Upon investigation, it was found that Baby O had an injury to his liver. Air had been injected into his bloodstream. This, once more, was no accident. Someone had deliberately done this to this poor, innocent soul. Dr. Brary urgently called Karen Reese. She was the duty executive of the hospital, telling her what had just happened and demanding that the vicious nurse be removed from the unit. Reese, instead of finally launching an investigation, simply said that the nurse was safe to work and that she herself would take the responsibility for any further situations. Dr. Brary was met with more disappointment knowing that this wouldn't be the end. He decided to remove the nurse from the unit anyway, placing her on clerical duties in the wake of inaction. Again, the mortality rate had slowed and the strange collapses ceased. Three months of peace would preside over the neonatal unit until in September of 2016, the hospital would receive a letter of grievance from Lucy Letby, the nurse that had formerly worked on the neonatal unit before suddenly being forced to work in a clerical position. The letter detailed the unprofessional behaviour and attitude that she had received from other doctors and nurses on staff, saying that she was constantly bullied for months. In response to this letter, all doctors and nurses were forced to write a letter of apology to Lucy. After writing the letter of apology, another cry for an investigation rang out towards the NHS Trust. An investigation that did happen and took two months to complete. The trust found in November of 2016 that nothing out of the ordinary was occurring in the neonatal unit. Every path had been exhausted and there was nowhere left to turn. Maybe they had just been wrong. Maybe Lucy Letby was just the sweet, fun-loving and bubbly nurse that everyone else said that she was. If that was the case, what else could have been causing such crushing chaos? Nurses and doctors combed through every option they could think of. Viruses, contaminations, anything they could grab onto to explain the horror that had been happening. They tried as hard as they could to come up with an alternative explanation. But no such explanation could be found. It had to be harm inflicted at the hands of a nurse. And that nurse had to be Lucy Letby. A year would pass until in May of 2017, police were finally called in to investigate the carnage in the neonatal unit at the hospital after the staggering mortality rates were finally seen on paper. After considering the option of naturally occurring reasons, it was more likely that the lost lives were the result of deliberate harm and it didn't take long for police to point to a prime suspect. With just the coincidence of her shifts alone, Lucy Letby was arrested. Hello oh, Lucy, is it? Yes. Hello, my name's Chesh, please. Look, it's Stefan, two seconds. Oh, uh, yes? Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, not a problem. Can you put me in the back seat over here? Hold on, man. Yes. Okay, you have to take a seat in there for me, Lucy. I'll move that seat forward a bit. Sure. Yeah, I just had knee surgery. So oh, right, okay. <coughs> Her initial interview would yield nothing. Lucy insisted that everything that happened was out of her control. She said that the whole neonatal team wondered together what may be occurring. They told me that there would be a lot more deaths and that I'd been linked to some deaths there. But look, did you have any concerns that there was a rise in mortality rate? 
Yes. Okay, so tell me about that. What concerns did you have? I think we don't just notice as a, as a team in general the nursing staff that this was a rise compared to previous years. However, this did not deter investigators. This only prompted them to investigate for physical evidence instead of a confession. Searches of Lucy's home as well as her parents' home provided the staggering evidence that they needed. Lucy had strangely been hoarding patient records. This was along with multiple handwritten notes about her thoughts and experiences. Among these notes were the words, I am evil. I did this. In Lucy's bedroom, over 200 handover sheets were discovered in shopping bags. Sheets which detailed the depressing ends and emergent situations of the babies in the neonatal unit. Police continued to search, turning next to Lucy's computer. Investigation into her search history found that Lucy had searched for 11 of the affected families on Facebook. Additionally, searches on her smartphone discovered a photo of a sympathy card, one that was sent to one of the families. The card was signed with Lucy's name. The police would spend the next year combing through the thousands of pages of reports and interviews, finally gathering enough evidence to charge Lucy Letby with her heinous crimes in November of 2020. All the evidence pointed to one fact. Lucy Letby was responsible for ending these infants' lives. A supporting role of this evidence included the text messages that Lucy would send in correlation with each lost life. She would bask in the sympathy she received as the unsuccessful hero in these infants' lives. She would say things like, It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Hard coming in tonight and seeing the parents. She would continue to garner the sympathy of her friends over each chaotic emergency, detailing each loss and complication. It was clear that Lucy had no remorse for what she had done. Years after these numerous incidents, families were forced to grapple with the fact that they did not lose their children due to natural circumstances, and that nothing had been done to stop it happening again. As news broke that these infants had passed away at the hands of a nurse, the powers in Westminster released a statement saying they would be launching an independent inquiry to investigate the inaction of the NHS Trust. Families looked back on her interactions with Lucy, with one mother realising that she had witnessed one of Lucy Letby's attacks. Despite not being his designated nurse, Baby C's mother had seen Lucy standing over her son's monitor. This was just moments before the emergency alarm sounded. Lucy Letby had been injecting that baby with air and she had been injecting air and insulin into the IV bags and the intubation tubes of every single baby, leading them all to either extreme health complications or to the end of their lives. Additionally, it was found that Lucy had injected some of the infants multiple times after their lives didn't end, with parents discovering the true horrors that the children had gone through at her hands. All of this and more would be revealed at her trial in October of 2022. There, every detail of her crimes would be aired out by witness statements. Lucy faced the weight of 22 charges. She pled not guilty to each and every one. The most compelling evidence that the prosecution would produce was the handwritten notes found inside of Lucy's home. The notes containing the troubling confessions of her evil nature and the fact that that she did it was difficult for the defence to combat. However, what was also present were notes declaring her innocence, leaving the question of her guilt extremely unclear. What proved to be truly haunting were the witness statements. Expert witness Dr. Dewey Evans took the stand, testifying to the harrowing instance involving child G. He revealed that under Lucy's care, the baby had received far more milk than prescribed, one that couldn't be anything other than a deliberate act, one with intent to harm. As the courtroom drama continued, 
Another startling statement came to light from Lisa Walker, a co-worker of Lucy's. According to her testimony, not only had Lucy Letby neglected to help when one of the infants was in distress, but had also chastised another worker for lending a hand. Lucy's squeaky clean, nice Lucy facade was beginning to crumble. As witness testimonies continued, Lucy's supervisor detailed the odd behaviour that she exhibited during her time on the unit. She would spend excessive time with babies that were not assigned to her care, with doctors witnessing her watch the oxygen levels drop and do nothing. Co-workers detailed how Lucy would neglect her own assigned infants in order to latch onto other infants in the unit, other infants which would later have health complications. As the trial progressed, the jury was shown Lucy's diary, in which she had written the initials of each of the babies who had passed away or that had experienced serious emergencies. The amount of time that officers spent gathering the evidence proved to be useful as Lucy's act was being destroyed. May of 2023 would mark a pivotal moment in the trial as Lucy took the stand in her own defence. With a voice full of emotion, she made the declaration that she had only ever done her best to care for the infants, saying that she was there to take care of them, not to harm them. As her questioning continued, Lucy introduced an unexpected claim. She said that the tragic occurrences were the result of plumbing issues within the hospital and that nurses were neglecting to wash their hands. This was something that the prosecution hadn't prepared for. They scrambled to continue their fight to prove Lucy's guilt. Nick Johnson, lead prosecutor, had succinctly summarised what the jury was meant to do. It was their duty to weigh the evidence presented, deciding whether Lucy was truly guilty of her crimes, of injecting air and insulin over 22 times into various infants, ones that otherwise would have had the very real promise of life. As the jury deliberated for 22 days to match her 22 charges, the legal teams of both sides considered what the outcome may be. While Lucy did have an overwhelming evidence against her, some of the 22 charges included multiple attempts against the same baby, but attempts that ultimately resulted in their survival. Would the entire trial be thrown out over any of these charges? Ultimately, Lucy Letby was found guilty of 14 of the 22 charges. She was found guilty of ending the lives of seven infants and attempting to end the life of seven more. Lucy refused to leave her prison cell for the sentencing hearing, apparently unable to bear the shame of the families of which she had destroyed. It was during this hearing in August of 2023 that the judge would equate Lucy's acts to sadism. This was a cruel, calculated and cynical campaign of child murder involving the smallest and most vulnerable of children, knowing that your actions were causing significant physical suffering and would cause untold mental suffering. You created situations so that collapses or causes of collapses would not be obvious or associated with you. You removed and retained confidential records of events relating to your crimes and checked up on bereaved parents. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. During the course of this trial, you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have no remorse there are no mitigating factors. In their totality, the offences of murder and attempted murder were of exceptionally high seriousness and just punishment, according to law, requires a whole life order. Lucy Letby, on each of the seven offences of murder and the seven offences of attempted murder, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. Because the seriousness of your offences is exceptionally high, I direct that the early release provisions do not apply. The order of the court, therefore, is a whole life order on each and every offence, 
and you will spend the rest of your life in prison. Lucy became the fourth woman in English history to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Lucy is currently working to appeal this sentence, hoping to see the outside world once more. On the other side of justice, Nick Johnson announced that his team would be retrying Lucy on just one of the accusations, one story involving a baby girl in February of 2016, a trial that will not take place until June of 2024. Nick Johnson will not be able to retry this case until after Lucy appeals the original conviction. In the meantime, the attention of many is turning to the NHS Trust, the organisation in charge of the hospital. Healthcare workers who had worked alongside Lucy have come forward to shed light on a troubling workplace environment. They have recounted experiences of a hostile atmosphere for those who had tried to raise concerns about Lucy and her crimes early on, and the pervasive fear of a destroyed reputation that swept it under the rug. Throughout Lucy's trial, several paediatricians who worked alongside her had repeatedly voiced their concerns about her behaviour only being met with resistance on the part of management. Dr John Gibbs, a member of the department, disclosed that paediatricians were definitely concerned that Lucy had been harming neonatal patients, but responses to these concerns would take months upon months to arrive. Many of the families, staff and public firmly believe that if the hospital's management had taken appropriate action, that many lives could have been saved. Dr Jayaram, a doctor that had raised concerns about Lucy Letby in October of 2015, stating that the truth needs to come out about why no action was taken to protect the innocent lives within the hospital. Additionally, the delayed involvement of the police is an even more concerning factor, highlighting a systemic issue within the NHS. Issues that could perhaps stem from the systemic underfunding of the NHS, the overworking of NHS caregivers, of unfathomable bureaucracy, of needless middle management, and the funneling of taxpayer money away from actual healthcare and into private entities and donors' pockets. Altogether, this contributes to a lower level of care, arguably by design. Dewey Evans, the expert witness for the prosecution, among many others, strongly believes that there should be a police investigation into the hospital executives who consistently ignored the claims against Lucy. Lawyer Tamlin Bolton is representing the families of several babies who were the victims of Lucy Letby, making civil claims against the trust in charge of the hospital. Bolton emphasised that the importance of scrutinising what the trust knew about the situation must to be uncovered for proper justice to be served, highlighting the compliance they hold in the tragedies that occurred. While the British government did launch an independent inquiry into the trust, many representatives of the victims' families have argued that this isn't enough. Letters have been sent to the revolving door of health secretaries, demanding the government to establish a statutory inquiry, an inquiry which would compel individuals involved to provide evidence as opposed to the independent inquiry which allows for them to opt out of providing evidence. Rob Behrens, the man who is leading the fight against the trust, has stressed that this moment is pivotal in the history of the health service, underscoring the need to understand why patient safety isn't given as much importance as the reputation of the management teams. The call for a more comprehensive investigation and the protection of those who raise concerns is a significant step towards addressing systemic issues in the healthcare system and in gaining true justice for the families involved that endure such heartache. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think can be done to avoid something like this happening again? Please do let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.